okay? So I'm gonna go over to XXVIII in the doctor's opinion, and I'm gonna start in the first paragraph. We believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. How many of you have had trouble with the idea of having an allergy to drugs or alcohol? And how many of you just thought it sounded silly enough you just didn't even listen to it? Because that, that's usually what happens, right? We just let it go. And we hear, how many of you have heard, you know, I, I got an, an aller, allergy to alcohol. When I drink, I break out in handcuffs. You ever heard that <laughs> hilarious fucking story? <laughs> this was, they did this for a reason. The doctor observed that alcoholics, for reasons he could not comprehend, had an abnormal reaction. And when a doctor, a medical person, describes an abnormal reaction, they'll say something like, that may be the manifestation of an allergy. Now, to layman, we wouldn't say that. We would say, oh, that's weird, <laughs> right? But the doctor said that may be the manifestation of an allergy, but the reason that's so profound, how many of you are drinkers? Good percentage. How many of you found that alcohol energized you? My, it's a sedative. That would be an abnormal reaction to a sedative. Don't you think? Where's my opiate addicts? Did you find that shit energize you too? That's extraordinarily ab abnormal, right? Okay, so the point is, is they wanted us to get this because it makes us part of a special class, this doctor thinks. These allergic types, or rather, the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. So if you thought you were an average temperate drinker and you have this reaction, you're mistaken. We don't know that you're not a hard drinker or you don't know any of that, but we know you're not an average temperate drinker if you're having this abnormal reaction. Does that make sense? This is a medical opinion based on experience, okay? It says these allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all, and once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, has that happened for you? Yeah. Have you formed a habit you found you could not break? Yeah. Once having lost their self-confidence, has that happened to you? Some people don't like to admit they've lost self-confidence, but showing up in fellowships of recovery is often a <laughs> passive admission. <laughs> that we've lost our self-confidence in, in one particular area anyway, right? Okay, their reliance upon things human. How many of you have tried to will it away, tried to do it for somebody else, all of that kind of stuff? Okay, their problems pile up on them and they become astonishingly difficult to solve. Is that true for you? Yes. He goes on to describe those of us that are still in the yes column Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. How many of you have had plenty of frothy emotional appeal poured on you? How did it work out? Not so well. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. Have you heard that in fellowship? People talk about depth and weight, and then they talk about horror stories. But these people are not talking about depth and weight, about how dark my darkness is. What they want me to understand is the depth of my redemption and the Redeemer. They want me to understand what's happening to me sensory that allows me to go from dead to alive. Yeah. Any of you get sick enough in your addiction that you really were just a dead man or woman walking? And then what happened? Yeah, we, none of us know, but we know, we know who. We don't know how, right? Okay, so, all right. So, in nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their life. So the doctor knew it, and he knew that was beyond his human aid, and the AAs knew it because they had had the experience. Some of you are feeling it because I feel you feeling it. Anyone know who's feeling what I'm talking about? Okay, so that's the power we call God. That's not happening up here. That's, that's a revelation within you, happening in you, okay? So we're going to jump because... We've all read psychiatrist reports and all these things, so I like to do step one out of Bill's story because we respond well to stories, right? 
we relate to stories. So I'm going to go to page, uh, let's start on page five. And I'm going to be right at the top of page five in Bill's story. He says, liquor ceased to be a luxury, it became a necessity. He, he says that with an earnestness because it wasn't, it was a real shift in tense. How many of you can sort of bring to your mind now, not necessarily your consciousness, but when you knew that you weren't doing it because you wanted to, you were doing it because you had to? Did it kind of go back and forth? Perhaps I overreacted. No? So he's telling the story of being in that place where, you know, I'm really not behaving like I want to in spite of my insistence that I'm doing what I want to do. I don't know if you can relate to what he's talking about. It's kind of a weird place we find ourselves. He describes what it looks like. Bathtub gin, two bottles a day, and often three got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars and I would pay my bills at the bars and the delicatessens. This went on endlessly and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. Any, any of you relate to him there? How did you fix it? Stay ahead of the curve, right? A little salt of the dog. Got to get after it. Okay, that's what he said. A tumbler full of gin followed by a half dozen bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Notice the words he used. They were required. Do you guys, did you take it that far where you, you had to do something? You were so sick you couldn't get it down your neck, but you had to get it down your neck, so you threw it up while you were getting it down your neck until some would stay down? Because it was required. Okay. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation. <laughs> so he's talking about the condition of, see, people come in and they think they're going to will it away. We come into fellowships and they say, just play the tapes, think it through. If you haven't had your, if you can't remember your last drink, you haven't had it yet. I can remember my last one and the one before that and the one before that and the one before that. What do you got for me? Because I'm, it's making me thirsty, all this thinking. <laughs> I call that to your attention because he's trying to describe the conditions of the insane mind, and we are the people who are insane, who do not believe ourselves to be insane, in a society who thinks we're doing what we want to do, when we know we're not. And it's very confusing. I I still thought I could control the situation, and there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. Did you have someone cheering you on? Gradually, things got worse. Now, I like you to pay attention to what he thinks is gradually, and then compare it to your own life. Because when we're in addiction, what we think is gradual, other people see as catastrophic. Any? Yeah. Okay. So, he says, the house was taken over by the mortgage holder. Come on, guys. That doesn't happen other than people in our class, like, multiple times in a season. <laughs> How many of you have been asked to leave more than one? Yeah, that's an abnormal reaction. <laughs> My mother-in-law died. My wife and father-in-law became ill. Then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at a low point of 1932, and I'd somehow formed a group to buy. How many of you came into a brand new business opportunity at the height of your addiction? What, what'd y'all do with it? <laughs> I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious bender, and that chance vanished. Now, we don't use terms like prodigious bender, but... <laughs> But you know what, I'm, what he's talking about, right? How many of you just kind of got lost in the, the zone for a week and thought, gee, I wonder if that guy's still there to meet me? <laughs> Some of you did. I woke up. This had to be stopped. I saw I could not take so much as one drink. I was through forever. 
Before then, I had written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. How many of you really meant it this time and had someone in agreement with you? No, he really means it this time. <laughs> what, what happened? Shall we read further? Shortly afterward, I came home drunk. <laughs> Guys, it isn't that I didn't mean it. It isn't that I wanted to let them down. I was powerless over the obsession to get free of me in the way that alcohol would free me of me. Got what I'm saying? That's what he's talking about, too. There had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? Now he's asking himself. How many of you went inward? How'd this happen? Now what am I going to do? What am I going to say? I simply didn't know. How many of you got to that place? Why'd you do that? I don't know. Yes, you do. <laughs> Have you had that interview? So then we make shit up, huh? It's her fault. Okay. Okay. It hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way and I had taken it. Was I crazy? How many of you got to that place where you questioned your own sanity? Wouldn't it have been nice to know that there was actually physicians that were in agreement with you? <laughs> I began to wonder for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed me near being just that. So, they're telling us what alcoholic addictive insanity is. It's a, an appalling lack of perspective. The inability to see beyond, to, to tell me to look back or look forward has no meaning in the moment where I am in so much pain I have to escape me. And so I medicate. How many felt that? Who felt that? That wasn't a high feeling, that was a shit feeling. But that's, that's highs and lows, powerlessness, right? Okay, so renewing my resolve, I tried again. Some time passed, and confidence began to be replaced by cocksureness. I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. How many of you got there? Started showing up in the meetings, got the 24, coming right on the cusp of 30, and then thought, well, perhaps I overreacted. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Folks, I'm not talking about a story I don't know. I spent a solid year trying to get a 30-day medallion. <laughs> it wasn't funny either. <laughs> um, one day I walked into a cafe to telephone and in no time at all I was beating on the, the bar asking myself how it had happened. As the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I'd manage better next time, but I might as well get good and drunk then, and I did. See the logic? But he does not realize that he's lost the power of choice. To, to have lost the power of choice, it doesn't matter. The insanity had already started by the time he walked into the bar room. The insanity of the first drink started before. It didn't happen after the first drink. See, and we don't know that until someone properly armed with the facts about themselves introduces us to the program of AA rather than the fellowship of AA. Okay, so the courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. How many of you took a drink after some time in, re in recovery or took a drug and then all of a sudden your mind's going crazy? What am I gonna say? How am I gonna cover this? Well, I'll just go in and tell them I just had one and it was a mistake and I won't do it again. Well, fuck, I'm not gonna have enough to get through the night, wait. Any of you been through any of that? Okay, because that's what he's talking about. I hardly dare cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by the early morning truck for it was scarcely daylight. An all night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. Think about how that had to feel. This is a guy who survived war. He was a war hero. He had been a, a genius on Wall Street. People spent millions of dollars on his advice. And all of a sudden, he's looking at the markets. He's got more.
faith in the collapsing market than he does in his own ability to stop drinking. Yep. How many of you feeling that? Yeah. Some of you have been there, right? Yeah. Okay. Then he says, that was a hard thought. What you just felt was what it feels like to have a hard thought. It's an experience of powerlessness and unmanageability that I'm now having to internalize. Does that make sense? When I make that admission, I'm talking about a sensory experience I have endured. Okay, so should I kill myself? How many of you had that thought pass? How many of you? I'm going to assume most of you decided not to. <laughs> or you're less successful than you hoped to be. Um, but I don't mean to minimize it because that's not always so, right? Okay, so then a mental fog settled down. Jen would fix that, so two bottles in oblivion. The mind and body are marvelous mechanisms for mine endured this agony two more years. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weekly. See how he tied those two thoughts together? He went to people he trusted, he stole from them, he knew there was no other earthly explanation for what had happened, and then rather than face them when he knew he was going to lie, when they knew he was lying, he's rather, he'd rather kill himself. He's trying to get us to see the strange things going on in our minds and emotions in addiction. Does it make sense? There were flights from city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape, and then came the night when the physical and mental torture was so hellish, I feared I would burst through my window, sash and all. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to the lower floor lest I suddenly leap. A doctor came with a heavy sedative. Next day found me drinking both gin and sedative. Some of us laugh because we recognize it. But he was talking about trying to detox himself at home. How many of you have tried that little trick or on the street? It's very dangerous. He's talking about how sick he got and he was self-destructive and so they finally called for a physician. The physician gave him sedative and then we found out, well, my alcohol problem is solved at last. <laughs> I simply had a Valium deficiency. <laughs> right? Because that's how we roll. <laughs> this combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity. So did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking, and I was 40 pounds underweight. My brother-in-law is a physician, and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much. Best of all, I met a kind doctor who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I'd been seriously ill bodily and mentally. Guys, we got to get that because that's the piece of the puzzle that addicts don't seek a healer when they don't think they're sick. When you think you're just selfish, when you think you're just flawed, I got to tell you, if you're sitting in this room, there is nothing wrong with you. That's what they're trying to tell you. You're sick bodily and mentally if you have addictive disorder. They have a solution. It's not a synthetic solution. Man has not come up with a solution. Not then, not now. But there is a solution, and we're going to talk about that. It relieved me somewhat to learn that alcoholic, in the alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor. Would that comfort you? Like what I'm doing and keep doing over and over again and everyone's telling me at the meeting, I just, I'm just not willing. And I thought I was willing. Until <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> Any of you ever been that guy? Yeah. Though it often remains strong in other respects. How many of you held a job, kept things together, but couldn't stop tearing everything apart? And it's baffling, isn't it? Cunning, baffling, powerful. You understand now why they use the words they use. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Did he help you understand your incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop? Did it help to understand, not only did he know 
how desperately you wanted to stop, but he knew how impossible it was for you to do it. And he wrote it in here so that we would have depth and weight, so we could level the playing field, so we could talk to you about a redemption experience that required something other than synthetic methods. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. That's a weird phrase too, huh? We don't see a lot of hung gooses these days. But he's talking about things that are looking up, right? Okay, so I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. So how many of you got a good dose of self-knowledge? And thought, I'm good now, I'm good. I don't pick up, no matter what. <laughs> but it was not. For the frightful day came when I drank once more. So when that happened to you, how devastated were you? Freaking devastated, right? Because I was serious. I'd even told people. <laughs> Y'all get me? The curve of my de declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. Look at the picture he's painting. How many of you used again, and then it didn't get just bad, it got bad quick? Like, you've seen people go off a ski jump, right? Like the ground moves away from the feet. Like, holy shit. <laughs> After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was the finish, the curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens, or I would develop a wet brain, perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or to the asylum. How many of you got such a statement from a doctor? Me too. Isn't it weird how unimpressed we were with that? <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. The family is devastated by that news, or maybe they don't give a shit anymore. But me, who they're talking about, it's like they're talking about somebody else. Don't tell me what, tell me when. You get what he's saying? He was done. Just didn't have the sense to lie down. He's trying to tell you how dead he was on the inside. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. Think about that. He just got news that he was going to have a wet brain or have to go to the asylum within months, perhaps within a year, or whatever. Just done. And all he could think of is, what will people think of me? How many of you relate to that? It's like people ain't been thinking of you for a while, dude. <laughs> right? Like you miss that ship. But that's where we are, yes? I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining that endless procession of thoughts who'd gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. How many of you got to the point where you just knew there was no way to make it right? There's, there's no reason to even try. If I don't try again, I can't fail again. Any of you get there in your... Okay. So he's going to give us an experience if you relate to him. No words can tell of that loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. How many of you can feel the loneliness and despair and feeling like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die alone, everyone hates me, I can't do anything about it, in fact, I don't even want to do anything about it. You relate to where he's at? So he's saying that's a bitter morass of self-pity, but if we've ever been there, no words can describe it. We just know it. Quicksand stretched around me in all of directions. I had met my match, I'd been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. So that's his first admission of a power greater than himself, guys. Don't get it twisted. We're not telling you you immediately have to have a theology and be you know, risen and confessing Jesus here. What we are telling you is that if you don't believe there's a power greater than you called alcohol, methamphetamine, heroin, cocaine, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> You're wasting valuable high time. 
go forth and moderate. <laughs> right? And then, then we'll work on growing spiritually once I realize I no longer safe, safely can take synthetic spirits. Fair enough? Okay. All right. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital, a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. How many of you got sobered by fear for a bit? All of us, at some point, right? Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink. There he is again, the insanity of the first drink. The insanity precedes the drink. It doesn't come after. What happens after the drink is the silly shit that happens to drunk people. Or high people. Okay. On Armistice Day, 1934, I was off again. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I'd have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was to be the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. So how many of you have heard about being catapulted into a fourth dimension of existence? Where's my meth addicts? You guys like catapults. Right? Sign me up. He describes it so we don't have to make it up. He's going to tell us what he means by catapulted into a fourth dimension of existence. He said, I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. So what he's promising you is at that darkest point in his life, he was just inches away from a new manner of living as a new creation that gave him purpose and filled him with peace. Does that make sense? So he's trying to, he's trying to tell us, man, if you're almost there, you're almost there. Let us, let us join with you and let's go, right? Because there's, there's a new life coming and what you were living was not life, it was death. Right? Okay, so near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen. Any of you ever sat drinking in your kitchen? <laughs> or wherever? Some of us didn't have a kitchen by the time we got out. <laughs> under the bush, behind the dumpster, whatever. <laughs> he still had a wife and a home, you know, so anyway. We make do, right? Okay. So with a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. How many of you had a stash? Like, I'm home, I'm alone, I'm drinking, and I have a backup. <laughs> so some of you can feel the satisfaction in that, right? Like, this is, this is a red letter day. <laughs> My wife was at work, think about that, all by ourselves. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle of gin near the head of the bed. I'd need it before daylight. So now he's even planning ahead. He's got enough that he's going to get drunk enough that he knows he's going to pass out. So if he doesn't hide it by the head of the bed, when he wakes up in the morning, he's going to be too sick to get out of bed. Yeah. How many of you were drinkers and drank like that? Yeah. Like really sick, right? So I need to be able to hit that bed that now. Right? And try and start working on the stopping the vomit flow. Okay. So my musing was interrupted by the telephone. A cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. He was sober. They put that in italics, guys, if you're looking in your book. Anytime they did that, it was an extra effort on the part of the authors. Ebby to Bill, the guy who called, his old school friend, is that one guy that no matter how bad Bill got, at least he wasn't that bad yet. <laughs> how many of you can relate to that guy or that, that person in your, yeah, no matter how bad we got, right? <laughs> it was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. So Ebby doesn't show up sober. So his coming sober is just wild. I was amazed. Rumor had it that he'd been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wondered how he'd escaped. <laughs> That's how amazing it is that this cat can be there sober. That he, he knew he was in, up for a commitment hearing, and the fact that he's there, he had to have busted out, right? 
because he has no idea what the story is. So he says, of course he'd have dinner and then I could drink openly with him, unmindful of his welfare. How many of you had those friends that it wasn't good for them to see you as drunk as you were, but they came and you weren't stopping, so you just didn't give a shit? And just, any of you? Any of you ever teased the people who were trying to be sober in your circle? Come on. What are you, on the taxi squad for AA now? Have a drink. None of you fuckers did that, huh? Okay. I pay penance every day for that shit. Okay, so I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was a time when we chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in this, this dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. So go out in your mind and look at what he's trying to describe. He doesn't really explain it, but what is an oasis when you're out in the desert? This desert of futility. It's often a mirage, right? You often end up drinking sand, right? I don't, I don't know exactly what he's trying to say, but he, he's trying to tell us that what we think is not necessarily what it is. So this party might be this healing, cool water, but the likelihood is it's a mirage, right? But the reason I point that out is because that thought came to him, and you're going to find out that this, in fact, was the cool drink of water. Because this is his encounter. But watch. Drinkers are like that. The door opened, and he stood there, fresh-skinned and glowing. Now, regardless of how you talk or whatever, to describe your drinking buddy <laughs> as fresh-skinned and glowing <laughs> is freaking weird. So there's a reason that happened, right? There's something strange in that description. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. This was troubling to Bill. Remember, he's drinking. Got it hidden all over the house. But the experience of him coming to the door was so profound, he's trying madly to figure out what's just happened to him. I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed but curious, I wondered what had got into the fellow. He wasn't himself. Have you ever been disappointed but curious? Yes. Yes. What's up with this? What do you mean? You want? I don't trust people that won't take a drink. <laughs> Although, I'll have more if you don't, right? So, come, what's all this about, I queried. He looked straight at me, simply but smilingly. He said, I've got religion. Now, I know about half of you in here are what people would call religious, right? Because they don't know the difference between relationship and religion. And then the other half of you really don't care for religion. But all I want to say to you is, if I'm drinking and planning to drink a lot, and someone's coming who I think is going to party with me, and when I ask them what's up with them, they say I've got religion, the fun meter just went... <laughs> This is going to suck. I'm going to get a lecture from hell. In fact, I think if you see a picture of hell, it's me at this table with this asshole. Right? Because that's just what we know we got coming. I was aghast, so that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yes, the old boy was on fire, all right, but bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. So I can't shut him up, but I can drown him out, right? <laughs> but here's the disturbing part, too. He did no ranting. Uh-oh. He's not behaving like a religious guy. That's weird. When I've decided you're religious and you don't act religious, that's going to bug me. <laughs> Especially when I'm drinking and fixing to get drunk. Yeah. Like, twist it off. Yeah. yeah. In a matter-of-fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. Wow, he didn't expect that. He thought he'd escape, but two guys had gone and testified for him. Two guys he didn't really know. They told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. Guys, why do we hide from, we say things in the modern fellowship like, 
I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. And we just confuse people. I go to church a lot, and some people would consider me religious, but I'm not religious, I'm in relationship. And it's different, I'm not legalist, I'm just obedient, because what else would I be? So what they're trying to tell, I can't. Once I've encountered it, listen, the chosen don't choose. I didn't pick this life, I was chosen for it. Um, the religious idea, folks, is that God dwells in you. It's that simple. That's all we're saying. There's power in you that's greater than you. Regardless of what you believe. And it's power to live. Okay? And then a practical program of action, which will prove that fact to me, through me, if I cared to go along with the idea. And so he says, that, that was two months ago and the result was self-evident, it worked. So there's the miracle, this guy can't be sober, there he is and he came to tell me exactly what happened to him. We owe everyone else we encounter no less. Which is why we would do the steps. Not because we have to, but to get armed with the facts about ourselves. He had come to pass his experience along to me if I cared to have it. Notice how he didn't come to pass the meeting list or a book. He came to pass his experience of redemption along to Bill. And he didn't even know, Bill didn't know at the time, that when he opened the door and he saw him there fresh-skinned and glowing, he encountered the presence of the living God. He had already passed it on to him before a word was spoken. That's what happened. That's the testimony of Bill Wilson, the famous atheist, by the way. So certainly I was interested, I had to be, for I was hopeless. He talked for hours, childhood memories rose before me and I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sundays way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge I never signed. My grandfather's good-natured contempt of some church folk and their doings his insistence that the spheres really had their music, but his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen, his fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died. These recollections welled up from the past. They made me swallow hard. Bill is describing to you a movement in his spirit that caused him to have an emotional experience. Has that ever happened to you? Something just so moved you that you had an emotional experience and people thought you were having emotion, but behind the emotion, was a move of the Spirit, a revelation of his father's, his grandfather's faith. He denied the preacher's right to tell him how he must live. You can't tell me how to worship my God. And he did it unto his death. That was a man who was sure who he was and whose he was, and that's what came to Bill, and then Bill was moved in the Spirit. Does that make sense? It's so important because later when they talk about God as we understood him, we're not we. So it's these sensory experiences that prove the power to us through us. That's the understanding we're growing in. Not doorknobs, light bulbs, group of drunks, none of that nonsense people have made up over the years. And they got precise instructions throughout the rest of the book of how we move forward. But the first thing is compelling testimony, depth and weight, right? Okay, so that wartime day in the old Winchester Cathedral came back again. I'd always believed in a power greater than myself. I'd often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are, for that means blind faith and strange proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, astronomers even the evolutionists, suggested vast laws and forces in, at work. Despite contrary indications, I had little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. Anyone get what you're saying? He moved from, I don't believe there is no God, I just don't like the word God, and, and I, I think there's order to things that I can't explain. He's telling you about his evolution. From the encounter he had, because he had been pronounced for years as an atheist, if you read his history. So, so he said, uh, I had... Little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much precise and immutable law and no intelligence? 
I simply had to believe in a spirit of the universe who knew neither time nor limitation, but that was as far as I had gone. So he knew there was something bigger than him, but he wasn't ready to name it, and he wasn't ready to claim it. Any of you ever been there? Okay. With ministers in the world's religion, I parted right there. Can you relate to that? I've met ministers, and I've been around religious people, and screw that. Come on, I'm not trying to dish on anybody. He's just talking about him. Half the original fellowship were atheists or agnostics. The other half were religious people. They were all similarly dying in addiction. So when they talked of a God personal to me who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, I became irritated, and my mind snapped shut against such a theory. Can you relate to it? To Christ, I conceded the certainty of a great man not too closely followed by the, those who claimed him. That's quite an indictment, isn't it? How many of you have shared that indictment? If we're honest, the religious guys and the atheists have shared that indictment, yes? His moral teaching most excellent for myself, I had adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult, the rest I disregarded. I mean, most of us can relate to that religion, right? How many of you did recovery that way too? I'll show up at the meeting and I'll tell others what to do. The rest I'll disregard. No? You yeah, haven't ever met that guy yet, huh? You will. Keep coming back. No. <laughs> the wars which had been fought, the burnings and the chicanery that religious disputed facilitated made me sick. I honestly doubted whether on balance the religions of mankind had done any good. Judging from what I'd seen in Europe and since, the power of God in human affairs was negligible. The brotherhood of man, a grim jest. If there was a devil, he seemed boss universal, and he certainly had me. Now Bill's telling you he believes in the devil, or he's willing to believe in the devil, but he's not really going to buy off on the church thing. So some of you can relate to the way his mind's working. Okay? So but my friend sat before me. This is the power of witness, folks. The blood of the lamb, the word of my testimony, the power of witness... But my friend sat before me and he made the point blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. Right. He didn't only say it, he stood there as evidence. While Bill is drunk and drinking. His human will had failed, doctors had pronounced him incurable, society was about to lock him up like myself, he'd admitted complete defeat. Then he had in effect been raised from the dead, Taken from the scrap heap to take, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he'd ever known. You ever heard the argument about whether we're recovered or we're recovering? Because it's not an argument. They say recovered 17 times in the instructions to this book. They only say recovering twice, and it's in the chapter to the wives about the still drinking alcoholics. So they meant what they said, but they just told you alcoholism wasn't a disease back then, so there was nothing to recover from. So what he's talking about is a redemption. Raised from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best we've ever known. It's not an argument. If you haven't had the experience, you couldn't explain it to anyone, and you wouldn't need to to anyone who's had it. The minute you spoke to one another, you'd feel that you'd had it. Right? So had this power originated in him, now he's going inward. Eyesight without insight is spiritual blindness. The minute he went inward, he could see clearly... Obviously, it had not. There'd been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute, and this was none at all. I've heard people complain, I don't want to admit powerlessness. They're not powerless. And I've heard that a lot from religious quarters. My friend Brad asked a question during a Bible study one night. How much power did Lazarus have to come out of that grave? None until he was called. Those of you who are not students of that book, I apologize for my... <laughs> that was actually Brad, but it was impactful. Thank you, Brad. So uh, that, floored, that floored me. It began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something at work in the human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past. Here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table. He shouted great tidings. And then they'll talk over and over again about the good news this book brings. 
but the book doesn't bring the good news. The recovered man or woman brings the good news as evidence of the new creation, yes? Okay, so I'm gonna go back down that page a little bit further. Um, I'm gonna go down to the bottom of the page, the second to last paragraph. So he, he comes to the, this point, thus I was convinced that God is concerned, I'm on page 12 for those of you following online or in here, is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, I felt, I believed. So no one was ever expected to come to believe in power in Alcoholics Anonymous without first seeing the miracle, feeling the power, and then coming to. The other thing that happens when we awaken is if you have a surgery and you go to the hospital, they take you to the recovery room, and what happens in the recovery room is you wake up. What is the goal of 12-step recovery? To wake up. So welcome to the recovery room. Okay. So he says, scales of pride and prejudice fell from my eyes. A new world came into view. The blind see. The lame walk. The captives are set free. The real significance of my experience in the cathedral burst upon me. So you guys, remember, if you knew his story, he talked about before he went to war, he was frightened. He went to a churchyard, getting ready to go to a very bloody battle, and he saw a gravestone. And it was an old soldier who had drank himself to death after the war. And so here he was, a soldier who had survived war. He had had this profound spiritual experience in that graveyard, reading that headstone. And now here he is, survived war, drinking himself to death in New York. And the power came on him again. The real significance, that power came to me, visited me then. That power's with me now. That's very significant, right? To know that, that that's what he's bearing witness to. For a brief moment, I had needed and wanted God. There had been a humble willingness to have him with me, and he came. But soon his presence had been blotted out by worldly clamors, most of them within myself. Why do I need a manner of living? Because I have profound experiences, and then they're blotted out by worldly clamors. I got a forgetter that kicks in. I'll never get out of this deal, forgetting all the impossible deals I've been brought out of. No one else has ever had that happen. So why would I have a manner of living in a process to try and stay awake? Because I'm gonna, if I don't, then my experience and my knowledge of this power is going to be blotted out by worldly clamors, because that's what human life is. Okay. And so it had been ever since how blind I had been. At the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise, for I showed signs of delirium tremens. There I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him. How did Bill then understand God? Very basically, but a tangible sensory experience. And obviously the beginnings of a possibility of, of redemption. Yes? To do with me as he would, I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. Does it sound like the third step prayer to you? Do you understand why there's a second step encounter with God before we say the third step prayer? Because the third step has no power unless you have encountered the power to carry out the decision. Right? Without encountering the power, the prayer is just empty words. 